Welcome back and uh, thank you so much for staying with us. You're still watching News Check in case you're just joining us. This program seeks to explore issues that are shaping conversation in the country and also we give you live updates on what is happening in Kenya today. And we are talking about a very, um, you know, important topic in our country, women in leadership. It is very timely because we're in that season uh, where a lot of decisions are going to be made in the coming months. And we are just tracing the journey of women in leadership in this particular uh, country and looking at even Africa as a continent, just sort of looking at uh, the scorecard on what we have done as a society to embrace women leadership. And I'm having this conversation together with a panel of two ladies, uh, Mwana Hamisi Sigano, uh, the head of programs at uh, Femnet and of course we also having this morning Gloria Oroba, a political strategist. Thank you so much Gloria for yes, creating time for us and yes. Hamisi. Uh, before we took the break we were just beginning to dissect the whole journey of uh, gender awareness, um, advocacy for gender and Gloria you pointed out something very significant on how this conversation has been made um, to be about women, to be about the girls, leaving the boys and the men behind, leaving them out of the programs, the policies that uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, ought to fuel this whole process. I don't know, uh, Mona Hamisi, from where you sit, how do you feel this is affecting uh, the progress we are making and attaining even the fruits of, of, of gender equality in the society? Um leaving the men behind um how is behind it behind where <laughs> <laughs> because i think i think i, I think why i feel like i i i directed the wrong question to you but <laughs> because i feel if you look if you look for example uh, i don't know if you have seen a recent what they called <laughs> au family picture yeah where the head of the state every year they meet in the au they do a family picture if you see that african union family picture it's men except one woman. So women have been left behind where? It's the, the, the men, men. They've not been yeah, left men. behind. That's where? what you think? Yes. Where are men left behind? But in this campaign if you look for at the CEO equality. Uh -huh. of the biggest companies in, in Kenya, yeah, are men left behind? If you look at the political machineries in Kenya, for example, are men left behind? If you look at businesses, at private sector, everywhere you could imagine, are men left behind because to date men make either hundred percent of the political executives in the continent uh, to eighty percent. The same statistic run around private sector in the boardroom, etc. So the ideal has been we had an equal world where one gender was given privileges, yeah, in expense to another gender. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So the efforts were made to untie and unchain the gender which has been undermined and structurally uh, ripped out of their right to be a complete member of the society. And that's what the effort has been about. So to me today, if you are saying men have been left behind in politics, the president is men, <laughs> the vice president is men. Like everyone in the top chain are men. So where are men left behind? Right. So I think the I, conversation I, I, let me, let me, let me needs to move a bit. We do understand, for I, example. I, be, I believe you're, you, what you meant is the men are being left behind in the process of, of attaining gender, gender equality. The women. By that, it's not about in, in these spaces. For instance, yes, we are on a journey of ensuring we have this uh, gender equality. But we are only using women, feminists. We are coming out as women to fight for our spaces. Yet the other strategy that we can use is having these men as allies in terms of influencing the mm -hmm. change from that side of, of, of the table. Mm -hmm. Which for me would be, it's not an easier uh, um, option, but it's a more impactful option. Mm -hmm. To get a man to actually go to his fellow men and tell his fellow men, by the way, in 2021, there are some of these things that you do in boardrooms that you need to stop. Than having a woman coming to a room full of men telling them, now from today you are going to listen to me. So I think the impact of getting allies in men in this fight for gender equality would be higher and is actually higher than coming out strong as one gender uh, seeming 
to attack the other gender. Mm -hmm. yeah. Monamisi, would you like to respond to that? Can we win alone as a block of women without bringing men on board and, uh, you know, addressing this issue of gender equality? Do they have a role to play? If you ask me for the years that have worked uh, in women's rights, I don't recall an incident where we have not worked with men, right? If we go today, all the work we are doing, for example, with the Kenya government to get endorsement or push their agenda, at the end of the day, it ends up, for example, in the Uhuru desk to make a decision. And we have been doing that because the, the structure itself is men-led and women have been working tirelessly to dent that structure and to flip and to alter relations of power. Why women are not becoming allies, why women are not uh, buying to that agenda is part of the challenge because they're not ready to give out the privilege. So to me, I feel it's disempowering if women have to shy away from the pain that they feel because they will be seen they are fighting. For example, I'm in no position to tell you how your shoes hurt. I'm in no position because they don't know it. I, it's not on my feet. Mm -hmm. It's your right to tell me I cannot do this. It's your right when you feel that you need to change that shoes to demand so, right? Mm -hmm. And I think part of the narrative, we have been making it, while everyone has the right to fight and to express what, uh, what they feel and to demand their right, for women to do that, you assume you're too aggressive. So I think one. And second, I want to go back to the conversation, what do we lose by, ha by not having women leader? I think there have been a number of research uh, across the board, which has uh, put uh, evidence on the table that we are losing so much for not having women leader. For example, ILO, uh, Oxfam have done, have gone to the level of doing calculation of the cost of unpaid care work. Mm -hmm. If we had to pay back women who are doing all the household chores, how much these women would have been earning and how much will the government earn for this woman earning and how much will the government for example and entity will be able to provide for other service because these women are earning if you're taking all these women to get into a labor force and earn uh, a wage income and all of them to have social security and medical cover how much will that mean to the to the uh, to the to the government to the society so the, Calculation has been done. AFAO have done a research and they've documented uh, that women could have tripled their yield and harvest if they have been in a position of leadership, if they empowered and if they are part and parcel of our, uh, agriculture transformations. Mm -hmm. So the evidence is there that we are losing a lot. And of recent past, we have seen, uh, for example, when we are battling uh, the pandemic, the countries that have been led by women, they were doing way better than countries that have been led by men. So there is evidence on record on the quality of women leadership. And to be fair, even those evidence that assumingly doesn't exist or can be challenged. No society would progress if more than half of its people are not in a position or are not recognized as an equal member of the society. It just cannot happen. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's for everyone good. We do believe that not only patriarchy hurts women, but it also hurt men. The standard for patriarchy and burden for men is are also high. And that's why, for example, as Feminet, we do run a men-to-men -men, uh, program. And part of that conversation is to get men understand that the system doesn't serve them as well. And it is on the advantage to start challenging the system of patriarchy mm -hmm. and oppression. Mm -hmm. Because let's, I think, to, to bring it home, let's face it, men are, for example, expected to have a best house, they're expected to have a nice car, they're expected to pay for this, they're expected to pay for that, because that is the deal of the society. While you are in an economy which is shaking and cannot attend that, the level of mental health to men and frustration is high. And because of that, they translate that to anger, uh, to uh, aggressiveness, and they end up uh, violating and abuse everyone near them, right? So, we have said and we continue to say the system of oppression doesn't work for men, 
doesn't work for women, mm -hmm. doesn't work for business, doesn't work for government. All, right. all of us lose so, if women are not right. uh, equal so ladies, we, we agree that in this journey for us to make progress, both men and women ought to come on board if you and can, have, if you have can a conversation. Allow me to just add something that might appear a bit contrary. Uh -huh. um, you see, to me, a leader, characteristics of a leader should not be looked upon from a gender perspective. Mm -hmm. I believe when we're looking for a leader, we're looking at characteristics. Is this person able to make decisions? Does this person have integrity? Are they honest? You know, we're looking for characteristics that can, to be honest, they can even be found in a dog. You understand? Mm. So you need to be able to isolate some arguments such that when you're saying we're looking for a leader, I do not subscribe to the ideology, even if that there, is, that there is evidence that women leaders have actually proven to be better quality leaders than men leaders. True, there could be evidence. But I would like to talk about the issue on leadership on a perspective that when you're looking at leaders, you're looking at the characteristic that this person brings as a good leader, in which case then we are isolating the gender element. And if we were to be honest with ourselves, there are people who would stand and identify themselves as women, others as men, others who, you know, we're in 2021, who mm -hmm. don't identify as with any, any gender. Uh, gender. Mm -hmm. Will you now start saying, men leaders are horrible because it has been proven over the years? She said it herself. The only proof we have on leadership in men is that that exists because actually a majority of the leaders that we've had in different industries are men simply because we've had a very patriarchal system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you take that evidence and then you take the exceptions of the few women who've happened to go to those leadership positions and say, look, there's proof that women leaders are better than men leaders. I think that's where now we differ because for me, I would rather say, look, there's evidence that this person here is actually not a good leader. The person, not, not, not the gender. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's, and that's the problem with approaching that argument. Because when you go to areas like Kisi County, that argument stands. They will tell you, men leaders have been proven to be the best because we simply have never had any women leaders. So, and then now when you come in and say, guys, you have to get women leaders because women leaders bring so much to the table. I don't believe it should be approached like, it should be approached that, listen, leadership is not about gender. So when you are looking for a leader, these are the things we are looking for. And if these things happen to sit on a woman or on a man or on a person who doesn't identify him, themselves with whichever agenda, that is what your focus should be mm -hmm. on. But because otherwise it creates this silent war. But are we, are we empowered as a society to think that way? Even the women themselves, That's when they go to ask for these opportunities, <laughs> the first thing they, the first card they will bring on the table is that I'm a woman. And that's where we go wrong. <laughs> that's where we go wrong because no one is going to go to the ballot just to elect you because you're a woman. People will go to the ballot to elect you because of the way you made them feel. When you're talking about boardroom wars, People will not just say, ah, to me choka now, and ume, every other time we have a chairman, a chairman, now we want a chair lady, so they pick any other chair lady for the purpose of gender equality. No, people will actually be like, you know, does this person bring leadership to the table? So when we're approaching the, the issue of leadership, I choose, and this is a personal, um, I'm actually very intentional on it. I, in, in fact, when we are in any position and, we are, and, and I have some sort of influence to push an agenda, I am very categorical that, you know, I'm not going just to push this gender equality uh, motion just so we can say now we have more women than men or now we have equal men. And, you know, like now the, 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 the idea of having one woman senator and one uh, uh, man senator in every county, which is being fronted by Building Bridges Initiative. You know, I think it's a step forward. But then now you ask yourself the quality of the people we're putting there. Then you ask yourself. This one woman who's being put there, are they just being put as a body count? Are they being uh, given uh, authority? Do they have enough autonomy so that they can be able to, you know, influence change? Or would you rather that I go to the political parties? I forget about putting seats for women. I go to the political parties and ensure that the political parties start fronting strong women to actually get elected. Because at the end of the day, we know a nominated woman and an elected woman. Who is more influential in those places? You understand? Mm -hmm. So that's for me, it's really also understanding that, yes, we are on a journey to getting to the place where we can say women have, have equal rights and they are equally on the table. Mm -hmm. But how we get there will determine whether this journey was worthwhile.
in terms of if we get there just by saying we are going to fight, you must give us seats, but then you're given seats that have no influence. Then you're given positions that are looked down upon, such as the women representative seat, which is looked down upon. Then you're, you're, you're given formulas to nominate women just because, okay, fine, you know, let's nominate women, we are going to do this in every county. Then at the end of the day, when you sit back and you're like, actually, now we have 620 women. Mm, but what are they doing? Eh, in the National Assembly. Mm, mm. But then when you go and talk about issues uh, such as how we are approaching uh, maternal uh, deaths and things like that, they're not still being, uh, you know, looked into. When you go on and, and check, you know, what was the agenda here? What was, what was, what, why were we pushing women to go to the National Assembly? If still the problems that we are facing as women, gender-based violence, eh, uh, issues on uh, affordable health care as, you know, for maternity and whatnot, issues such as uh, empowerment, empowering and ensuring that the girl child has, is educated and is not married off. If we have 600 and something people in the National Assembly, but still we remain with the same statistics on the issues that we are facing now. Are we not going to say now we have reached a place where we have reached the gender equilibrium, but then you look and it has no impact whatsoever. So that's why for me, when you're approaching the issue on leadership, I'm very intentional to remove the gender out of it. What I'm actually intentional on is if I see a woman that has the leadership skills that we are looking for, and they have come out and they are pushing their agenda and they want to act, they are actually passionate about leading. Of course, I will be biased, not because uh, they, they, they are just a woman, but because, hey, listen, here's a woman, but who also is uh, competent enough mm -hmm. to go out there and compete with these other competent men. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very, very strong point there, Gloria, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not about the body count. It's not about the gender. It's about the quality of leadership that you bring Absolutely. on board. Absolutely. So if, yeah. if we do not have such a woman, I'd rather we have a man who can deliver on that, right? Absolutely. That's right. what I'm saying, actually. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> But I'll tell you, you can't say if we don't have such a woman, they're there, they <laughs> exist. The only thing, they okay. need to be boosted and pushed and told, don't be afraid, come out. But they exist. They exist in equal numbers we as them. them. If, not, if anything, they probably, we have more, more women who are competent. The only thing is we need to now get them out. <laughs> but then they shouldn't be looked upon such as, right. you know, we're just electing women. Guys, let's just elect women, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I have you see your body language, you have something to add on to that. That was powerful, I wish I right? could say no. <laughs> <laughs> that was but so... That I don't have anything to add. But I do. I think uh, there, there are a few things that I, I really uh, want to, to contribute to the debate. One is the gender, co I mean, is the construct of leadership. Leadership by itself is a very masculine, masculine, uh, thing like it has been constructed at the thing that only men can do and it has a masculine title right to date if you had to affirm that you were a leader whether even in your office you have to be tough you don't have to smile you don't have to be <laughs> the, because we are taking what we know of men leadership that they have to be brutal you have to be this you have to be the and that's the quality of quote unquote leader and that's why women are seen that you are not qualifying because i can be a leader and i can still smile i can still laugh i can still be a good person mm -hmm. i don't have to scream on top of my voice mm -hmm. to be a leader i don't have so the actual construction of what a leadership is and who is the leader is biased and is gendered and is masculine. So that is one. And because of that now, we are judging women based on men categorization and definition of a leadership, which is wrong. So that one. And two, I want to just to shed light on the quota system and why the quota system has been uh, implemented and adopted in most of the country. One, there is evidence that people learn by seeing, for example. Mm. So the first option, when we recognize that women who made more than half of the population are nowhere in the leadership, a person who embodies a woman's body will look at leadership and feel that's not what I can do, mm. right? So the first intention of the quota system is to break that and allow women to see themselves. So to give to open a space where women can lead and be role model to other women. So when I'm seeing Martha, I say I can also do that because I have seen an example 
that women can be leaders. So that was one function and should not be underestimated the power of just having somebody. I'm a Muslim, for example. I come from a place where my community will tell me we don't see us in these spaces. Yeah. So the power of representation in itself is of absolute importance. Yeah. That one. And two, the intent of uh, this special seat and quarter system was also to give women now uh, sort of apprentice, uh, uh, to give women uh, an opportunity to learn by doing. So to get to the system, know how it works, and then the uh, the outcome of it we expected that there will be women who are getting through the special seat, get the experience, the knowledge, the etiquette of how the system works, and then go out now uh, and vie in the, in, the, uh, in, in the contested position. I will give, if I have to give, for example, example of Tanzania, we have 30% special seats, yeah? If all women who are in the special seat, for example, will be there for two terms, and then go out and contest, contest and then another group of new women coming in in those special seats. In the coming 20, 30 years, you will have 50, 50 or above because you have machinery that has been granted, which should nurture you, and you go out now, you compete because you know the rules of the game, you have been there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that is the second uh, question. And I think to me it is important to also check our biases. We often over analyze the qualities of women leader. Mm -hmm. We are led by men who are absolutely incapable of leading, who have no skills, really? but we never <laughs> question. Really? Yeah? When it comes to women, no, you have the, to... If you, if you look at the crop of leadership in its entirety and look at the male leaders, you'd yes. say like we have no male leaders? No, I'm not saying we, like in totality, mm -hmm. but I say it in, the, in that leadership. We have men, yeah? We have some men who, they might not have degrees that is required, yeah? They might not have the, but they are, because they're men, like they're, uh, how should I say, they're, they, how they've been scrutinized is not the same as how women have been scrutinized. When women are getting in leadership, people want to check your bio, you yeah? mm -hmm. Do you have this degree? Mm. Have you been this and this? Have you been this and this? <laughs> the, you play, the playing ground is not level. And they went as far as how mm. many times have you been married? Have you <laughs> drink beer? Have you, like the qualities and the checks and scrutiny is extremely high because we expected women leader to be sent as well. Oh so right. the same mistake, for example, a man leader will do. When women leader commit the same mistake, it will be a grave mistake. So to me, the question of bodies, women bodies, and in all their diversity, I should emphasize, it's important because I feel a society, that ha the leadership has it to present the composition of the society. Mm -hmm. If any leadership doesn't reflect <coughs> a composition of the society and how the society, because we see our society from our leaders. If I don't see this person, this group, this... I know there's something structural wrong. All right, wrong. all right. Well, Hamisi, I want us to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the progress we have made. Yeah, we're talking about um, improving the status of women and allowing them to find it uh, fair. Let me not say easy. Find it fair to get into these opportunities. I'll cite a good example, the two-thirds gender rule. I feel like that was our biggest test as a country to whether we are ready to embrace women leadership or not. If you ask me, I think, <laughs> should I give us a scorecard or? <laughs> you know, first, I, have I, we passed that I exam want, or we I want, failed? I want to correct your language because <laughs> you have fallen into the trap of this patriarchy that's going because you said, have we reached a place where we are allowing women to you know, the idea of allowing means mm -hmm. that it is me who gives you the authority to now go there and prosper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every time, and, and you'll notice I have... But uh, there has to be some level no, of no, goodwill. No. The idea of allowing women no, the, the, to do there anything... There has to be some level of goodwill. No, no, Let's no, not no. ignore that's the power what, of goodwill. That's what we need to change. That's the culture. You know, my, my fight in this uh, gender progressive uh, development kind of thing uh, is completely from a very strange place. It's, it's from the cultural mindset. And as she spoke, there's this vision that we put that, you know, this is a leader and we've made it so masculine. So I would rather spend time fighting those small things that are actually indoctrinated in us, such as language, you know? Sometimes uh, um, 
uh, fellow men that I work with or business partners, sometimes even my husband would say some, you know, the word allowing. I say, you know, when you say, no, but I allowed you. No, you did not allow me because that <laughs> means that first of all, you took, you are the person in authority to first tell me that you can, you can exist. Now I have allowed you to be here. She's a tough one, and this if, one. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, I, if, I, if I let those kind of uh, terminologies pass, what I'm saying is I am allowing for our younger people to be cultured into believing that first you must seek permission to, to even be. So the first thing of, you know, are we creating a conducive environment to allow the women? No. Are we creating a conducive environment such that the women can look around and think, yes, this one, I can thrive here, so let me get in. It starts with the language, by the way, and then it starts with the things that people see, you know. When I walk into any meeting, this is something I have never said in public, but I walk, when I walk into any meeting, you will, if you know me, I'm very strategic at where I sit. Because the first thing that people assume leadership is you must take the seat of the leader. And if that is what our, our, our society has been, you know, carved to think, then I am working with those assumptions. So if we've been carved to think that the leader sits in that chair that is facing this one, now Ngine Wanangaliana, that is where as a woman, when I walk in, that's where I go to sit until someone tells me, <laughs> stand up, this is not your seat. I say, why? <laughs> Because, you know, that's how you start changing the perception. Yeah, yeah true. And the little things. I can tell you, I cannot recall once where I've been told to stand up from that seat. Even when I have sat in the wrong seat intentionally, knowing that this is the seat where the chairman of this caucus is sitting, nobody will dare come to me and say, uh, move from this chair. What they do is they just take up another position. So I think the things, the, the wars, the battles that we should be fighting, I don't think it's these battles of, you know, the, the, the combative ones, where it really looks we are out for the other gender. I think it's the small things. It's the terminologies, it's the, the, the appearances. For instance, uh, I, 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 as a woman who's in active politics, I barely ever wear trousers, not because of anything, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, I'm a woman, I will be in my skirt, I will be in my dress, you are going to embrace this as leadership. I barely ever leave my house without lipstick. Not because I can't survive without it, but I, you know, you, it is, it is, I want to get it into your head eh, that I'm a woman. And you know, there's no running away from that. You're not going to suit me up and put me in trousers and make me look tough and what. You know, I've had people in my team when I'm, I'm, I'm down in the grassroots tell me, you know, uh, you know, this dress makes you look not authoritative. And I say, it doesn't matter because that's not, we are not selling a dress here. I'm going to speak to those people and then when I speak to them, they'll, they'll be shocked about this young girl who's coming here <laughs> looking like a girl. So the battle that we should be picking as women is not being combative with the men, but simply understanding, you know, to, in, in order for you to fight a system that exists, you know, you can't come with a new system. You know, you're, you're fighting uh, uh, gender inequalities and injustices, eh? You can't come with your system of feminism and think you will win in that system. What you need to understand is, this is what we are fighting. These people here think, being a leader, you have to look like this. Now, am I going to look like that? No, but seeing as I have this position, I am in a position of leadership, mm -hmm. I will make it so obvious for them that imagine I am the chair of this caucus, I'm wearing a skirt, I'm putting on my lipstick, and I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. Gloria, you know, I, I'll take you back to, 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 to the question then. Um, you know, our failure to embrace what is um, enshrined in the Constitution, the two-thirds two gender, gender rule. rule. Does, the, the two are we being genuine in, in, no, this, you see, in this journey who was, of gender who equality? Who was implementing the two-third gender rule? Mm -hmm. You know, that brings me back to getting allies. These men are allies in our fight. You come with your two-third gender rule, then you take it, it's like you have come with this solution uh, about uh, for the victims, and then you take it to the oppressor. You understand? You've, you've drafted something very beautiful, and, and, and imagine I'm the victim in this, and then now I'm taking it to my oppressor that, listen, this is the system I want you to, to execute. And now that person has not been sensitized. They are not part of this journey. You, you understand? Mm -hmm. Those men in the National Assembly, in the executive, in, in these offices, in the Senate, they have never been part of this journey. Can you speak? I can't even think of one elected uh, male leader who has gone out to walk with women when they said, my dress, my choice. I can't even think of one elected MP who has come out to run around with us when we are saying we are tired of sexual harassment. I can't think of one person. Now, how are you Uhuru. going to draft? No, <laughs> no, because if and, he and, had that goodwill, and I can the tell Garissa you, Senator, uh, The I Garissa Town MP uh, also, Adan Dwale, has been very pivotal in... 
when they brought that discussion the in the General National Assembly, journey. where was he? Where was he? You know, there's, there's that thing of appearing to look like I am assisting so that I don't get the backlash. But when we were having that discussion in the National Assembly, where was he? Where were they? You see? So for me, the, the, the thing we don't understand as women in this cause is we need allies. Unfortunately, the allies that we must make are men. Unfortunately, the people who are in those positions that can actually influence the cause of this journey are men. Mm -hmm. Now, am I going to fight you in your office or am I going to say, come and sit down with you and tell you, Your Excellency, this is where it has been going wrong. This is happening and this, so, this is what I beg mm -hmm. to get from you. Once I get that ally, that goodwill from this person, I can tell you we would not be talking about uh, gender parity and, th and nominations of women mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you are working with the system to get them to correct all those injustices on gender. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's, let's break down these injustices. Because I ask myself, what countries like Rwanda did right that we are not doing for, for women to actually um, be ahead in terms of leadership compared to us? What is it that women go through, the injustices that women go through um, that would, would really sort of act like bottlenecks for them not to thrive, for them not to get into these leadership positions? Let me start with you, Mona Hamisi. Um, I think the bottleneck is so many. Uh, and part of, 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 of one of the bottleneck, I think, it's, is, is, uh, is the, the construct of, of the patriarchy. Uh, just to, to, to add my, um, a spice a bit in the, in the truth theory composition, because mm -hmm. the truth theory is, it is not been about specifically women. It just said any gender should not be, um, any gender should not be more than two thirds. It's just now it happened because the parliament is majority men, mm -hmm. then that sort of like benefit women. Mm -hmm. If all and all I do believe feminism can overthrow the, the system. <laughs> so when that happened and you have majority of the member of parliament women, possibly it will be men now benefiting no, from, from the system. Mm -hmm. But the blindness of the idea that this cannot happen uh, and this is, is our position and rightfully position and we need to protect it. I think that's, uh, that's part of the problem and that's why I feel the reconstructing of that reality mm -hmm. is extremely important. To reconstruct the reality where all of us know that we do have a role to play and all of us have equal rights and equal opportunities. So I think that one. And two, uh, they have been, uh, the progress that have been made in a couple of years, we have seen, for example, uh, uh, girls' enrollment in school has been very low. But 25 years later, after MDG and now SDG, most of the countries are recording high level of uh, young girls' enrollment in a primary school. I think now it's at least 50-50. But it continues to drop as you go high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is projected that in the coming 10, 15 years, these young girls that are, which have been enrolled uh, in, in, in high number in the primary school will then transit to secondary school, will then transit to universities, and that will have a ripple effect mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the leadership position. So it, it will be better if we work uh, and we address structural challenges. So education is one of them. Uh, attitude uh, towards women leadership is the second. But third, uh, it's, it's the policy itself. Uh, and I think to your question, uh, while the, the intent of the policy, and I do feel women of Kenya fought so hard for two thirds, it was not given to them. Mm -hmm. They fought for it. Uh, in the lead up, uh, in, in, uh, in rewriting the constitution, the work that women of this country has put in that constitution was immense. And it was uh, uh, an example to the women across the continent mm -hmm. on how much you can achieve. And I, th I, I strongly feel it was not a women agenda, yeah? Because the constitution has been voted. Uh, to be a constitution. Mm -hmm. So everyone who was that was in that in, constitution was involved. Was involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we had it in the constitution, because if it would have been for women only, it wouldn't have been in the constitution. All right. I want us to hear from the horse's mouth. Uh, Gloria, uh, very briefly, you, you are in this particular journey mm -hmm. to becoming a leader in this country. Mm -hmm. Politics is where you've actually just, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. thrown yourself to. How has your experience been? 
You know, first of all, I believe politics is really where you can have the highest impact, unfortunately, as a leader. Uh, politics influences policy, influences governance, it influences everything down to the price of the sanitary towel. So um, I was very intentional on how I want to get into leadership and I chose politics because I truly, truly believe that that is where you can have the highest impact. Mm -hmm. My journey so far has been, I will not lie, it's been very, very difficult. It's been, um, it's been characterized with a lot of challenges. And I'm not talking about uh, just challenges of resources as a woman, but I'm talking about getting that mentorship that you need in politics. I'm talking about getting um, accepted into certain spaces. I'm talking about having to fight to be visible in a conversation where clearly you're the only contributor, but still you have to fight for that visibility. Mm -hmm. It's been such a challenge on that front. But then now when I talk about when you want to say, I'm end up ground, talk about TV station. Who mm -hmm. kwa ground down there when now you are actually going to sell your agenda, your manifesto to the people there? The first uh, the first point of rejection, unfortunately, <laughs> is from the women. So because the culture that they have been brought up in is, you know, you're actually wronging. You're wronging uh, us by standing for this seat because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm starting from a point of sensitizing the women that actually, you know, you're a leader in your house. Do you know that you're a leader in that house? Because you're the one who knows what people are eating, where, what people are dressing, which children are going where, which school. You know you're a leader in that marriage because you're the one who organizes everything down to the bedroom. We know that. You, so I have to come and tell them, actually, what you've been doing your whole life is you've been in leadership. So this is just another kind of element of being in leadership. And so when I started, it was so shocking for me, not shocking in the sense that I'd be rejected by the same people I'm trying to represent, but shocking for me in the sense that the magnitude, the magnitude of patriarchy down in the grassroots is insane. Now, uh, after a couple of months of sensitizing people and doing the advocacy work, it gets better because, you know, um, in general, Kenyans are very pragmatic. In my county, Kisi County, we are very pragmatic. So, you know, the first thing, there'll be this shock that a woman is vying for anything that is not women rep. But then the more they listen to you, the more they see the activities, because I'm doing a lot of activities in terms of social enterprises. I've set up a lot of businesses in my constituency. I'm working with schools, even before I get into that seat. And, you know, I'm rallying resources from my friends, from the international community, from NGOs, just, you know, uh, look into issues such as uh, uh, access to health, care some places don't have water you know <laughs> trying to get NGOs to go there and and dig boreholes and things like so when they start seeing your actions and then they start feeling your impact then they stop seeing you as a woman and you see uh, unfortunately I, I I have chosen to be the experiment you know because it has not been done before mm -hmm. and I've chosen to be so I cannot complain right. about you know breaking those um, uh, stereotypes all right so Gloria um, <laughs> I, I, I want to say yeah, as your, as your final uh, As my word, final, because, because I have yeah, to leave. She has to step up. I out. really have to leave. Uh, and actually, the funny thing is that I have to leave because I'm, I'm trying to uh, ensure that we have more women elected mm -hmm. in, in the meeting that I'm going. I think this is the idea when we are talking about um, being a woman and particularly in politics. Um, you have to go in knowing that it's a very, very, very green area. It's not been ventured by many, particularly from my county. And there's no time, we actually don't have the luxury to be sad. And we don't have the luxury mm -hmm. to cry when you go online and read those things. And we don't even have the luxury to, 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 you know, have a moment to yourself because it's like one job after the next, one challenge after the other. Mm -hmm. You just have to come knowing that, you know, my focus is come 2022 and I'm in office. I already now, by the fact that I've declared so many other women have started to declare, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that they are vying. Mm -hmm. So for me, whether I win or I don't win, but I will win, yeah. I'll tell you that, <laughs> I've already inspired so others. much right, change right. just by the one year that I've been there. All right. Yeah. All the best, Gloria. Thank you very Gloria much. Gloria Roba, yes. a political strategist, and also uh, she's uh, vying for the Member of Parliament. Which constituency? Bobasi constituency. Bobasi constituency yes, in Kisi yes. County. All the best with that. Asante sana. All right. We're now going to...